And um, today our lecturer is uh, Professor Tomasz Rubicek from Charles University. Uh, Professor Tomasz Rubicek was graduated at computer science from Faculty of Gen Engineering at Czech Technical University. Uh, then he worked for a while in General Computing Center of Czech Academy, uh, Czechoslovak Academy of Sciences. Um, he defended his um, PhD in 87 at Technical Cybernetics and uh, this then habilitation in 1995 in Physical Mathematical Sciences. Uh, since 1995, uh, uh, he's working at uh, Mathematical Institute of Charles University and also um, right now in Institute of Thermomechanics, Czech Academy of Sciences. Interests of Professor Rubicek are nonlinear partial differential equations and inequalities, especially elliptic and the parabolic types, applications in continuing physics of solids and fluids, um, optimization of variation calculus, related numerical methods, numerical analysis, computer implementation, and simulation. Professor Rubicek uh, visited a number of uh, countries and uh, his longer stays uh, were at Weierstrass Institute in Berlin, then in University of Roma, University of Augsburg, and in Technical University of Minho. Professor Rubicek wrote uh, four books and 150 research articles and uh, he supervised uh, three PhD thesis and is a, a member of um, several editorial boards. So, and today Professor Rubicek is going to talk us on Eulerian mechanics of finitely strained multipolar media. Yeah. Check. The floor is yours. The screen is yours. Yeah. 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 So, so thanks for uh, uh, just a detailed introduction. Uh, maybe I can only correct that it's no longer Czechoslovak Academy of Sciences, but uh, Czech Academy of Sciences, since we split with uh, our friends uh, in Slovakia. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks also for uh, giving me uh, opportunity to uh, present this topic on, on that uh, IFIP uh, TC7 platform or working, working group 7.2 precisely. And uh, yeah, so so within that uh, half an hour that we spent on installation, I forgot to ask how, how long should I talk? Uh, Professor Setner, how, how long uh, am I expecting? Well, let's say. 45 minutes up to 60 minutes. Yeah, okay, that's so, 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 yeah. uh, Okay, so uh, I, I, I will present. Uh, I am still fighting this. Ah, no. uh, so I, I will present uh, Eulerian mechanics, uh, particularly of solids or also some fluidic uh, continua. And uh, first, I will start uh, with a uh, little another topic, but nevertheless related to this. Uh, some uh, just visco elastodynamics in linear settings, small strains, and particularly in one dimensional, and uh, uh, investigate or, or just present uh, uh, dispersion and attenuation analysis, uh, how elastic wave, uh, waves propagate, and uh, particularly how it is influenced by uh, putting some gradients uh, in, into the model, which is then used in the large strain uh, nonlinear mechanics, uh, typically in our communities uh, in, for mathematical reasons, but it has also some mechanical interpretation, which is maybe not much spoken story uh, among our community. Uh, 
among other mechanical communities, uh, they do not care about rigorous analysis. So these are other disconnected uh, communities. So I think it's it might be quite interesting. And so then I will present Euler and mechanics of uh, some few particular rheologies. And uh, because of this uh, working group 7.2, uh, general interest is in some uh, optimi optimization, optimal control. So I will briefly present how it is, how it can be reflected in, in some optimal control problems. So, uh, yeah, so just basic rheologies, uh, you may uh, just saw already uh, this uh, re schematic rheological elements, elastic spray, dampers, and mass. And uh, the basic uh, arrangement, particularly used in mathematics, is uh, parallel organization of uh, elastic element and the damper, which is referred to as a Calvin Foyt rheology. Uh, so it sums up, it sums up stresses, there is some uh, conservative stress and some viscous dissipative stress. So they sum up. And uh, or alternatively, one can also express this uh, second order viscoelastodynamics as a first order system of two equations, uh, momentum equation and, uh, and uh, some equation for stress. So, so I think this is just a very standard known. Some other organization of these elements are in series which gives Maxwellian analogy, so it sums up uh, strains, not stresses. Or it might be also uh, some uh, more element uh, uh, schemes. So here it is so-called Jeffrey's analogy, or sometimes also called uh, anti analogy. Yeah. So there are a lot of other analogies, uh, so using more elements and uh, maybe the, the basic classification might be parabolic versus hyperbolic uh, which uh, means uh, that uh, uh, so, so parabolic is of course better for analysis but it prevents uh, high ultra high frequency propagation so so typically it is that there is some damper which connects, uh, uh, which makes a connected pass. So here it is one damper in the Calvin Foyt, it was also one damper, but it may be more complicated. So this is this is uh, parabolic for me and hyperbolic. And so this is this Maxwellian analogy. So it can, it allow propagation of high frequency waves because for high frequency waves, you can forget this damper, it's stiff. And, uh, and then it is just, uh, as the dynamic equation. Uh, and another classification can be fluidic versus solid. Fluidic for me means that if you put some loading, which stays, so then uh, the deformation will evolve forever. If you stop loading it, the system will not, the, the configuration will not return back to the original configuration. So for example, this is fluidic. This is also fluidic. Kelvin Foyt, it was, one spring which just connects the two sides and it just is responsible for returning uh, the, the configuration to the original stage. Yeah, so this is some basic classification for me. And I will focus on the parabolic technologies, both solid, both fluid. Yeah. So they mentioned Maxwellian analogy, it sums up uh, strains. And the system of uh, first order equation is momentum equation, and then the equation for stress is a little more complicated. Yeah. So it is hyperbolic because uh, here velocity is uh, derivative of displacement, and it has the same order of derivatives on the left hand side and right hand side. So this is this characterizes hyperbolic analogies. Yeah. Jeffrey rheology, it sums up stresses, also strains. 
So it's some just manipulation, which you might not care about in detail. Uh, maybe just a general hint. So what is really important to pay attention is blue lines. Yeah? So maybe you can skip a lot of other lines because there is a lot of information on the slide, of course. So, so here you can see that there is also some, some polynom here. And uh, so this is uh, now parabolic because uh, here you can, in fact, see the second time derivative of displacement and this is lower than the first derivative of stresses. So, so this is what characterizes parabolic systems. This is what we as mathematicians like. But yeah, or alternatively, one can also express it in terms of rates of this group. So then, then this is just some, so some form which you may see sometimes later. Uh, yeah. So now this uh, dispersion and attenuation of waves. So uh, I guess uh, some of you or maybe most of you knows uh, how to make this analysis. So just this is the basic wave equation. One uses this ansatz. This is a sinusoidal wave, but in complex variables, uh, the wave wavelengths lambda up to the factor of phi is real, but the angular frequency w is complex value. Sometimes you may see the opposite, but it, it should be the same. Analysis, of course, yeah? And then if you put it into this equation, you will get, uh, after some manipulation, you will get a single equation, algebraic equation, but in complex variables, which actually represents two real value equations, which are referred to as Kramer's Kranich relation. And from this, after some another manipulation, you can see velocity of the waves, uh, which is here square root of c over mass density. Yeah? And uh, also you may see this factor gamma, this, this imaginary part of the angular frequency, which gives attenuation. And this is related to the so-called Q factor, quality factor, which is uh, which has several definitions, uh, not exactly identical. It was uh, invented by some electrical engineers, but it is used in seismology. So, yeah. And uh, essentially, it means uh, that uh, it, it, it wants to say how much uh, energy or how much amplitude, which is not the same, uh, is lost within one cycle. Yeah. So here, Q factor is infinity, so it is, it is uh, very ideal propagation of waves, nothing, no energy is lost, it is simply conservative system. So one can now try to use it for Kelvin Foyt rheology. So there is this blue term which is added to the wave equation. After some manipulation, you will see some other term which is now dependent on the on the wavelengths. And uh, there is some critical wavelengths and if it and below which this argument became negative. So that means the velocity would be imaginary, which is uh, of course not possible. So then ultra high frequency waves cannot propagate. This is what it wants to say. Yeah? So, so now you see the non-trivial dispersion of the speed of, of the waves, depending on wavelengths. And this is how the Q factor reacts and so, so low frequency waves, so that means high wave, waves with long wavelengths propagate very easy and opposite they can propagate as well. So Maxwell model, so you see this blue term which is added to the to the wave equation and it uh, needs it leads to so-called anomalous dispersion. Uh, that means high frequency waves uh, propagate easy. But uh, if the frequency decays, so that the wave length uh, is large, so then they cannot propagate at all because the creep effect starts dominating and uh, it prevents propagation of some waves. 
so and for comparison with Jeffrey's serology, so it combines it, so it puts, leads to a general non-monotone dispersion and uh, corresponding uh, to factor. So then some gradient theories. I will confine myself only on space gradients, not time gradients. So which is what is used uh, in uh, basically analytical reasons. Our, our mathematical community. Yeah. So, so here you can see this blue term added to the Kelvin Foyt model, and this is some hyperviscosity. And uh, so it contributes to the normal dispersion, and uh, you can see the comparison with uh, if one just tune it that the critical wavelength is the same for both options either standard viscosity or hyperviscosity. So we can see that the hyperviscosity in fact facilitates propagation of uh, waves if they are close to the critical critical lifelines. Yeah. Uh, okay, so conservative gradient. So this is uh, uh, this additional term, so you, it's like a beam equation, yeah? and you can see that it compensates uh, the normal dissipation, and uh, in some uh, particular situations, it may lead even to a non-dispersive model, you know? uh, and uh, also the Q factor is has some. And uh, such regularization or singular perturbation, you can also do it like this, is, still, is used in large strain mechanics uh, in Lagrangian formulation, by the way. But uh, I think this connection with uh, wave propagation is uh, never mentioned. Too. But I will not uh, focus to Lagrangian formation, but rather to organic light. So another interesting model is uh, dissipative gradient in the Maxwellian rheology. So this is uh, pi is uh, the creep rate, classification rate also you may somehow imagine. This is some uh, uh, length scale parameter in meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is added like this. And after some manipulation, you will get an equation for a single variable with displacement which is called the dispersive wave equation. And you can see some additional term, which is sometimes called micro inertia. Yeah. So this is second space derivative on the uh, second time derivative. I was always skeptic when I saw such terms in mathematical literature. I, I, I always thought that it's very artificial, but, uh, but in fact, uh, they can be uh, just generated by quite reasonable numbers. And uh, so it leads uh, again to anomalous dispersion as uh, in the usual Maxwell rheology, but uh, it may even help uh, propagation of some uh, ultra low frequency waves. It is quite curious yeah, because you have a dissipative gradient, but it leads to less dissipation. Yeah, so another regularization is a convect, uh, conservative stress gradient. Yeah? So now it is under time derivative of stresses, second derivative. Again, L is the length scale in meters. And uh, it leads to anomalous dispersion. Here it is uh, uh, purely, uh, purely conservative system. Yeah. So there is anomalous dispersion, but nevertheless Q factor is identical plus infinite. Yeah. And this is the concept which was, uh, which was actually invented in a little different way by, by uh, uh, Samal Eringen and uh, Aria Fantos, uh, long time ago. Yeah. Uh, if it is applied to the Maxwell rheology, so it may lead, so, so this uh, dotted line is uh, the original Maxwell model, just for comparison. And uh, so it may lead to some more, to some general non-monotone dispersion. 
but nevertheless, uh, even ultra high frequency waves can propagate. Uh, so it, it does not it, it does not have any critical uh, frequency or critical wave lines at this point. Uh. So it does uh, critical wave lengths for ultra long wave lengths. Uh. So uh, yeah, so there is uh, also some other gradients sometimes so in literature conservative regularization of the Maxwell analogy so it's like this and it also has some impact of, of, of uh, dispersion and uh, impact and uh, so sometimes uh, it's also seen uh, some uh, strange regularization but uh, nevertheless it is sometimes some interpretation regularization of that kinematic constraint, which seems that it's ultimate uh, constraint, but nevertheless, sometimes people play with it. So this is some diffusive regularization. And uh, it's interesting if you apply it to uh, Kelvin Floyd model, you can do it by two ways. So one is uh, uh, just to write Kelvin Floyd trilogy in this way. And then it leads to such a dispersive equation, which is, if you remember that model, that it leads both normal or anomalous dispersion or even no dispersion. Or if you apply it to Kelvin Floyd model in such a form, which without this regularization is equivalent, but with this regularization it is no longer equivalent. So it gives like a classical Kelvin Floyd model, but only with a little different coefficient. Which is viscosity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now brief introduction to uh, finite strain kinematics. Uh, well, quite standard notation and uh, and concept. So uh, deformation acting from reference configuration to an actual one. Uh, actual conf uh, actual uh, coordinates are denoted by small x, uh, Lagra referential one, Lagrangian, capital X. Uh, yeah. Deformation gradient uh, is uh, capital F. Uh, just, uh, I will distinguish uh, uprighted element, uh, uprighted fonts referring to uh, referential configuration and slanted fonts to referring to deformed configuration, deformed. Yeah. So here you can see that uh, this is a function, y is a function referential x, and it maps it to a actual coordinate x, a spatial coordinate. Yeah. Referential velocity, uh, inverse uh, motion or, or return mapping, reference mapping, it has several, several names in literature. So it's denoted by psi. And what is important, if you make a composition, this uh, Lagrangian quantities, you will get Eulerian quantities. Mm -hmm. So this uh, return mapping itself is uh, governed by such a simple transport equation using this material derivative or convective time derivative, which uses this Eulerian velocity. And then, okay, one can define velocity gradient, it's Eulerian velocity already, and uh, one gets up to, this is just general kinematic equation for for Eulerian deformation gradient. So this is an ultimate kinematic equation. Or in Jacobian, we will get such an equation for scalar deformation determinant. Uh, determinant of the formation gradient. Uh, well, in equations, you may just play with F, forgetting uh, the underlying deformation. But nevertheless, it's it's interesting uh, question whether there exists some underlying deformation, and this is really not automatic, uh, and uh, it it needs some typically some local non interpenetrability. Uh, Causing that the determinant of the formation gradient is away from zero, and uh, 
and uh, it also needs fixing of some boundary condition, and that is a famous result by John Ball, who also generalized later by some other people, that under these uh, conditions, uh, return mapping is invertible and uh, it leads to the underlying deformation. So then one can really say that F is a deformation idea, that there exists some deformation that generates F. But in principle, one can forget this and to just play with the model and uh, only it might be that it loses the validity uh, during the evolution. But uh, okay, maybe just some summary of uh, concepts in finite strain or large strain mechanics. There is a Lagrangian approach that everything is formulated in the reference configuration on a fixed domain. Uh, then the, it has some advantages comparing to Eulerian approach that uh, the fixed domain easily allows for uh, playing with actual deforming configuration. Mass density is constant, uh, no transport equations are needed, but on the other hand, coupling with the actual fields like the gravity, gravitational field. Electromagnetic field is not straightforward, and there is some um, involved pullback, push forward manipulation, uh, occasionally involved in the equations. And uh, also, the reference frame often does not really exist. Yeah? So, so it's uh, uh, and it's rather artificial. So, so, in geophysics, for example, on ge geological time scales. So what is the reference frame? Is it what is now or what was million years back or billion years back uh, in liquid or gas media? So it's also a very artificial concept. So for this, the Eulerian concept might be more natural, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it has also disadvantages. Uh, so so uh, advantages that it reveals really the actual physics, uh, coupling with uh, space field is easy uh, and there is no reference uh, configuration explicitly involved but evolving boundary is very problematic it's, it's really very bad and then people just pass by this problem that they embed it into some fictitious bigger domain it's got it's used in engineering or in geophysics under the sticky air approach uh, the name in engineering is an immense boundary but it has also some analytical difficulties uh, which makes it maybe easily testing okay so Kelvin Foyt analogy uh, uh, in Eulerian description yeah. so this is the momentum equation if you remember Kelvin Foyt sums up stresses uh, now have a look that uh, mass density is no longer constant and uh, it evolves if it is compressible medium then uh, it is not nearly transported but it is it's governed by continuity equation uh, and there are okay so concept of uh, hyper elastic materials is uh, what is also quite often generally used that the conservative stress comes from some stored energy and uh, there are some options actually three reasonable options that uh, the stored energy is uh, referential referential but you know I do not use referential configuration but simply this is some something which you can find in uh, some physical tables you know? And it may depend on X, but uh, well, if it is non homogeneous, and then one, one must use this return mapping. And referential may be in Joule per cube meter, which means Pascals, or Joule per kilograms, which, by the way, means uh, meter per second square. Uh, so you can see both options in literature. Uh, the, this uh, second option is, by the way, uh, original Einstein's idea that uh, uh, you, you, you know this 
Primus equation E is uh, mc square. So this is E divided by m, energy divided by mass is light speed square. Okay? So this is in that spirit. Okay? Or it may be uh, in Pascal's, but actual. That means that this meter square is not referential meter square, but actual meter square, which if the material is compressed, there is more energy, that, uh, more energy than so. Okay? And then uh, to these three options, they correspond three conservative Cauchy stress. So first option, you can see that there is this determinant of deformation gradient. In the second option, there is instead of this, there is uh, mass density, which is related, by the way, by this uh, formula, mm -hmm. if the continuity equation is satisfied. And in the actual configuration, you do not see uh, this determinant anymore, so you, in fact, you may forget it. Uh, you may forget it. You may forget controlling the determinant of the formation gradient, but uh, it is compensated by some pressure like that. Okay? And the overall stored energy, which you can get, you can see when you multiply the momentum equation by velocity and next on algebraic manipulation. So, so this. This is the free energy which corresponds to these three options. Uh, then dissipative Cauchy stress is the symmetric part of uh, velocity gradient. It may also uh, involve some hyper viscose term. So this is the resulting system is here. So it contains three equations for mass density, for velocity, and for the deformation gradient, and here it is this hyper stress, which uh, is the concept of uh, uh, that quite old concept uh, coming back to uh, to Tupin and Mendeleev, and it used in the mathematical uh, community by Natchez and his collaborators, and also by Elliot Fried, Mark and that thing. And uh, the trick is that. This uh, higher order term, which is basically fourth order term in fourth order gradient on velocity, it ensures that the velocity is civilized you know, in some sense, that it is uh, Lipschitz in space, integrable in time, uh, or even with some power. And this is well known that it facilitates transport of uh, some of quantities here, mass density, uh, deformation gradient. So then it replicates the regularity of initial conditions. Mm -hmm. So no singularities can, can emerge. So, so this is a relatively dirty trick, but uh, it facilitates uh, any you know, quite complicated analysis of this order and formulation. At least this is what they have to do it. In Freud's, they can they can live without this, but uh, there are some very special situations, and uh, and it's uh, very involved theory developed by by Pierre Louis Leon and Edward Feinreiter and uh, such. Yeah. So uh, just if you remember the influence of this higher order term on dispersion, so it leads to to the norm, normal dispersion. In 1D linear analysis. So, energy balance, so you can just uh, maybe I will, I will skip it. So, this is what is uh, expected. Maybe note that this is obtained by testing the continuity equation by this nonlinear test, momentum equation by velocity, of course, and the kinematic equation by again this nonlinear test in general. Yeah. So, just a general observation system is very nonlinear, and time discretization does not work. Even if, if you if you have some viscosity at small at some nonlinear small strain problems, it usually allows using time discretization. But uh, here it is so nonlinear that it does not uh, convexify it even for a very small time stretch. Uh, and nonlinear tests are also problematic for the method. Yeah. Uh, 
And so, uh, notice, then just the way out that one can make step by step Galerkin's discretization, which I call Galerkin's semi discretization. That the first discretization, if it is put into the limit, it makes uh, the transport equations uh, continuous, and only after this one can start playing this with the physical, physically motivated estimation, which is as mentioned. Okay, so. Also, sometimes people play with regularization of this kinematic constraint, uh, uh, some diffusive regularization. And if you remember, it uh, leads to normal or anomalous or even no dispersion uh, in just small, uh, small strain than in linear analog. So it may give certain justification of this. Uh, Unphysical regularization. Mm -hmm. So there are some references. And of course, this is not realized in mathematical community. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, some now fluids. Eh? So before it was solids. Now fluids are characterized that they do not have. Elastic response for deviatory part of the stress, only for volumetric part. Which means that uh, the stored energy depends only on Jacobian of the formation gradient. And, uh, and that uh, function is typically not passive because uh, fluids cannot withstand negative pressure or at least not too much negative pressure. Sometimes little negative pressure is out. Or gases cannot withstand negative pressure. Uh, and then, if you just put it into the previous ansatz, so you will, after some manipulation, some some calculus, the derivative of the determinant leads to cofactor and then simply multilinear algebra. So then you will see that uh, that it leads to some pressure contribution to. To the, to the Cauchy stress, the Cauchy stress yeah? and then it leads to some equations which reduces the original three by three system to only three plus one system in three dimensions. Yeah? And uh, and this equation is in fact isentropic state equation. Yeah? If, if you would have temperature involved, you would get a full state equation by this one. The second option is the, if phi is referential in joule per kilogram, so it leads to a little different pressure, a different expression of pressure, the same pressure, of course, and different, different expression for isentropic state equation, which relates pressure and mass density. And the third option leads to some a little bit and another form of the pressure, and then what is Interesting effect that this actual uh, stored energy after some manipulation leads to such a form of uh, momentum equation. And in some situations, when we have some, some steady flow uh, organized uh, in certain laminar way, you can see that this pressure, which I call Bernoulli pressure in quotes, should stay constant. And this is the old Daniel Bernoulli principle that the kinetic energy, uh, pressure energy, and internal energy stays constant. So, Jeffrey's rheology and Eulerian, I should accelerate it. So, at large strains, it is uh, uh, related with so called multiplicative decomposition of uh, total. Information gradient to uh, elastic, uh, okay, elastic distortion and uh, inelastic or, or creep distortion. And the stored energy depends on the elastic part, of course. And uh, again, there are three options as before now, depending on elastic strain. And uh, in addition, now there is some uh, kinematical 
no, no, kinetic equation for some creep distortion rate LP yeah. governed by some modification of this Cauchy strain, and this is referred to as a non stress. Yeah. There are some higher order gradients involved. Now it can be involved in two positions. One leads to a normal dispersion in the 1D linear situations, if you remember. If you do not remember, I just reminded. And uh, the other one leads to anomalous dispersion, so they can be combined. Okay, and uh, typically, uh, or just always, uh, this uh, creep distortion is isochoric, that means the determinant is equal to one. Which means that it contact it's it involves only only the operate part, not the volumetric part of the model. So in fact, uh, the model plays with two different rheologies combined. Uh, in volumetric part, there is a solid rheology, Kelvin Floyd, and in the uh, uh, in the deviatoric part, it is fluidic. Uh, so so. It, it wouldn't make sense. It's quite important that it is solid rheology because under long lasting compression, uh, the media should not uh, compress forever. Imagine water in ocean being compressed in billions of years. And this isochoric constraint is a non affine holonomic constraint, which looks like a disaster, but anyhow, it can be reformulated as a linear constraint on uh, this uh, creep rate and uh, if initial condition satisfies this isochoric constraint then it's kept forever yeah. so it's not so that model and uh, still up, it is usual to have some algebraic manipulation which which leads to a kinematic equation not for f but for elastic uh, elastic distortion and then total deformation gradient can be completely uh, eliminated as well as uh, this uh, inelastic uh, distortion. Yeah. So this is what is often used. So then the resulted system is like this. And uh, yeah, and in principle, one can reconstruct uh, the inelastic distortion, but one does not need to care about this. And this is, uh, well, more or less the old concept of uh, Erasmus Lee from Stanford, and uh, you can find it in developer textbooks. And, and so, so this is, I am presenting something which is relatively standard or very standard, but maybe not much uh, known in some communities. Yeah. So without this, uh, this uh, regularizing, Okay, no, so how is it? No, okay, so just uh, this uh, kin kinetic equation without regularization allows to eliminate uh, this creep uh, uh, rate. And uh, then one can also play with some another regularization here, which is used often if uh, one expresses it in terms of uh, uh, left Cauchy green elastic tendril yeah, with Fe, Fp transpose. Yeah. So then instead of this, uh, this quite simple derivative, one gets a little more complicated derivative. This is upper convected time derivative. And uh, then it is also related with Aldroyd B with elastic fluids. So it is very popular model. And it actually arises by this quite natural light. So that there is a lot of literature about this. And uh, it, it leads to non monotone dispersion. Okay, energetics, I will skip it. It's it's quite, you, you see that there is some manipulation. If you test momentum equation by velocity, this is of course ultimate test. So then it is some, in some sense quite involved manipulation and one then gets the expected energetics behind the model. Okay, just a note that you can also involve various internal variables, uh, scalar, like damage, alpha, uh, so then one gets some 
but that one must have some particle evolution rule for damage, and it involves convective time derivative. Uh, on diffusion, again, some diffusive equation governed by gradient of chemical potential, also involving uh, convective time derivative. If the internal parameter would be vector, which might be magnetization, polarization, then at this point, it should be objective time derivative and mere convective derivative is not objective. So one must play with some, some more complicated derivatives. Often, Zaren by Alma. You will see it, so it's just a moment. So there is also small strain linearization. Uh, well, I think everyone knows uh, this uh, uh, just concept of uh, playing not this deformation, but displacement, and then small strain tensor, which is symmetric part of displacement gradient, additive decomposition to elastic part, and inelastic part, or plastic part. This inelastic part is uh, typically isochoric, which here means trace of this symmetric tensor is zero, but not deformation, uh, not, not determinant equivalent. So it does not have any sense now. This is quite different character of this linear equation. And it can be combined with large displacements. So it then leads to a convective model, but expressed in some small strain linearization. This is, by the way, what the geophysicists do. Yeah? So they, they basically never use this really large strain in mechanics. They use this linearization. The trick is that this uh, additive green Nardi decomposition is expressed in terms of rates. And then it should be some objective time derivative, typically correlational, which means that it, uh, if the frame rotates, uh, then these objects will somehow reflect the rotation properly. And uh, so this is this general rotational derivative. And the uh, most simple way is to use uh, the skew symmetric part of the formation gradient, which is which leads to Zaren by Oman derivative. But uh, it, there are some objections against this, so it may be also some other, other variants. And, uh, and okay, and, and then one should play with stored energy. And now there is only one option because the referential options which reflect the uh, uh, determinant of deformation gradients are now completely irrelevant. So one should only play with this actual stored energy which contains this additional stress, so this additional pressure contribution to the stress standard. So then one gets such a model. Bundle you know, stress is now simpler. You know, but it contains this pressure part, but okay, but this pressure part is not visible because there is the deviatoric part of this stress. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then it combines there are some higher order gradients as before, it combines anomalous dispersion and normal dispersion. Yeah, okay. So sometimes people play with uh, some variant of stress diffusion. So this, this kinematic constraint is regularized parabolically and it leads such a equation for strain and uh, you can find it in some you know, recent article by Thomas H. Katarina Hatsmilka, for example. And okay, so uh, impact on the, on the dispersion and uh, Q factor. Uh, so, and uh, okay, and now the last part. Uh, well, this Eulerian mechanics has certain well, perhaps interesting impacts on uh, consequences if you think about some optimization of such systems, optimal control, identification, uh, some game theory. You know. So first example, incompressible Neohookian ansatz. So this is, the G is uh, the shear modulus. And uh, so this is only the deviatoric part of the deformation gradient. 
and uh, corresponding Cauchy stress. And you can see that there are four naturally arising bilinear forms. Another example is compressible now, who can? Okay, it's bulk modulus, so it is uh, shear modulus as before. And then it leads to such a system which also involves pressure. This is some very particular form of, of the volumetric uh, part of the spot energy. So it, it leads to such a pressure K is bulk modulus. Okay? And uh, so you can see that in fact that is the P is is the bolded P is uh, momentum, mechanical momentum, which is uh, rho times velocity. So optically it is bilinear, but in fact uh, it is trilinear. <coughs> so one can get rate of this that by some simplification that rho is considered constant, which is often quite relevant case in uh, Water is typically the variation of pressure are very small uh, because it is often considered as incompressible, although it is not incompressible because otherwise the sound can propagate. And uh, so this is certain compromise that it is compressible because there is the bulk modulus, but nevertheless, gross stays constant. And to get a correct energetics, it must be some compensating force. Actually, devised by Roger Temam in order for some approximation hypothesis. And there are also some bilinear forms. Now, it's even six bilinear terms and one quadratic term. Okay, but now we can. So, okay, maybe I will, I will let us skip it. So, this is this uh, Jeffrey's theology, but in fact, uh, this uh, creep, uh, right? Uh, leads to a trillionaire form. Again, if you substitute it, it is. Okay, this diffusion, again, some trillionaire form, and uh, in the linearized setting, this is what I mentioned last time. So then here you can see this uh, Warren Bioman derivative. So it contains uh, uh, three bilinear terms, and uh, the rest is similar. In the semi in the, what is this? Mm. Okay, so one can uh, split volumetric part governed by this pressure and uh, deviatoric part. And so now you can see a lot of bilinear terms naturally arising and, and uh, for fluids, volumetric, uh, uh, deviatoric elastic response. Vanishes and you can see such a system in the semi compressible variants. Okay. Optimal control of such a system. So I will use only, I will present only two examples. One is the first one example was incompressible now, who can, if you remember. So, so this is such a system containing uh, four bilinear terms. Yeah, you, you may remember it. And uh, it leads to a, a joint equation which has eight terms which has which are generated by this bilinear terms. Yeah? So, uh, so it, it, it contains uh, this uh, the solution of the system itself, so this F and V, and interacting with the adjoint equation. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, for analysis, uh, so it it is difficult to estimate such a such a bilinear terms also in the controlled system because one should optimally uh, guarantee uh, uniqueness of the response for a given control. Otherwise, it's uh, stress. Mm -hmm. So it's well known that, for example, in uh, now we have Stokes equation without regularization. This is an open problem in 3D, yeah. even encompassing. Yeah. yeah, so so that's why one needed, in fact, some higher order gradients which are not involved here, or just notational simplicity. And there is some 
quite involved analysis, playing with Galeardo Nenenberg interpolations. And, uh, yeah, so so it's well, maybe some challenge also. Okay, the other example was the last example, if you remember. So it was with semi compressible fluids. So it contains uh, what, uh, four bilinear terms and uh, one quadratic terms. And uh, so the adjoint system contains corresponding corresponding uh, uh, mixing terms uh, for a joint velocity and for, for a joint uh, pressure. And uh, well, again, some higher order gradients are needed for, for rigorous analysis. Uh, you might put it both to the continuity, to the momentum equation and to the equation for pressure some of them at least. And uh, final note is uh, for uh, face for some face field fracture model. So it contains some internal parameter of damage. <coughs> and uh, some gradient damage. So now the stress tensor contains another quadratic term, which is Kotevac stress. But the damage uh, should be governed by some variational inequality. And this is a general problem. Uh, and uh, the, okay, and then it was some preliminary terms which can be somehow reduced if you consider this uh, left Cauchy green tensor B. So here you can see this uh, upper convective and derivative. And here instead of F, F B, so you have only B. So there is this alpha times B. So it, Optically like, simplify the system. Anyhow, so the sensitivity analysis needed for formulation of optimality conditions is very non trivial uh, because of the non smoothness and uh, evaluation of some sort of generalized gradient needs uh, can be done at least at this moment only for space time discretization and in the denomination variant of such a model. Uh, I can refer to the paper of Lukáš Adam and Pedro Prada myself years ago. Yeah, so maybe some uh, final messages uh, to be taken home. So to say is that uh, uh, that finitely strained viscoelastic solids uh, complain also uh, this uh, well this Eulerian formulation. Not only what is typically conventionally considered Lagrangian. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it is uh, the side effect also well compatible with the scholastic fluids, and one can also combine it with, uh, to, with each other. So then it leads to the fluid, uh, to the solid fluid interaction, or sometimes uh, structure, so fluid structure interactions. Yeah. So rigorous mathematical analysis and well-posedness of the models uh, needs, I think, quite ultimately some higher order gradients to be involved in particular spots of the model. And uh, this can be interpreted also mechanically that uh, it may fit some dispersion of uh, propagation, speed of propagation of elastic waves. Uh, and uh, also corresponding to factor. Yeah. For example, job, uh, seismologists are interested rather on two factors uh, than on, uh, on dispersion of wave, but on speed of waves. And they have some very specific uh, uh, measured data and they devise the models with the goal to fit it with this experimental data. And maybe the last uh, message might be that in some situations or even many situations, I, I didn't mention uh, magnetohydrodynamics, for example, as uh, generates uh, many nice bilinear terms in the system. Uh, so then it, uh, it leads to some uh, just maybe interesting analysis 
this honor information in contrast to Lagrangian. When, you, when one is interested in some optimization problem, it may be identification of parameters or some games or optimal control. And I think, uh, yeah, so there is some literature, uh, just uh, my own and some photos. And that's all. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Rubicek. And now we start uh, discussions. Uh, do you have any questions, comments? So let me start first with with question because my special field is stochastic control and optimal control, and my question is the following: You had three examples of optimal control. In two of them, the function was quadratic with respect to control, and the control entered a linear. But of course, dynamics was very complicated. But in the third non-smooth exams, I couldn't see the functional. Could you show uh, what's your functional? No, no, no. So it's uh, there was no functional. I just only yeah. So it was just a remark that it's complicated. Nothing more. Yeah, it should be some functional. Yeah. Of course. You are right. Some. Yeah. But by the way, but what was control parameter in a sense? What was control p? It it was the the control. No no no. So uh, you know here it was only maybe a remark. I maybe should say it more explicitly about the system, which uh, has also some bilinear terms, but it might be difficult for just uh, sensitivity analysis. And uh, so in that paper with Lukas Adam and Tejio Trata, it was some identification problem. We wanted to identify some parameters uh, controlling, uh, I think, uh, fracture toughness. So, which is uh, here, that, there should be some coefficient. Of, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, and the control, what the control? Maybe we, we just uh, try to fit uh, the response to some desired response. It was. Uh, that's only an academic example, uh, and yeah, so so it was other identification mm -hmm. So okay, okay, so so here it is. Yeah, so there was there is no real optimization problem. I just explicitly okay. written here. Okay, and other questions, comments? Do we have? Oh, I do not hear. So maybe Francesca, want, you want to say something? No, no? OK. So then let's thank Professor Rubicek. And uh, let me announce that we shall think about another IP special lecture sometime at, in the end of, uh, of January. OK. Thank you, everybody. and. Uh, it seems that Barbara Kaltenbacher uh, asked to talk. Is it correct? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I just, uh, I just wanted to uh, give my hand. <laughs> just uh, applause. It's not racing. It's just doing this. Yeah. But you cannot see me. Sorry. <laughs> Thank about thanks a lot for their very clear and inspiring talk. Ah, oh, okay. So thanks for your. Uh... Enthusiast, enthusiasm that it was clear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, participants. And uh, I shall inform later on about the next special lectures sometime in January. Okay, so thank yeah. you.